Did you know that when the Washington Monument opened in 1888, it was the tallest building in the world? It's just one of the many facts to be found in weird but true know-it-all, U.S. government from National Geographic Kids. It's a fun and informative book designed for middle grade readers, but it also happens to appeal to the kid in all of us. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner and welcome to the Kids Bookshelf. Ahead, we'll explore the book and I'll talk with the author about some of the weird facts about government in the United States that you might not know. Michael Bergen is a historian specializing in biographies and writing about current events for younger audiences. His previous books include Who Was Henry Ford? Who Was Theodore Roosevelt? The Creation of the U.S. Constitution and Weird But True Know-It-All Middle Ages. He joins us to talk about Weird But True Know-It-All U.S. Government. Michael, welcome to the Kids Bookshelf. Thanks very much, Dan. Well, Michael, this comes out at a good time because, of course, this is uh, an election year here in 2024. So let's talk a little about a little bit about the presidency and some weird facts or little known facts about the presidency you'd like to share. Well, I think the presidency itself, we deal pretty straightforwardly as far as what they're how they're elected, what their uh, qualifications have to be, what their duties are. But then we do get into some of the um, more personal side of, of presidents. Um, I was struck by the fact that Teddy Roosevelt and his family had almost like a mini zoo at the White House that included um, a pony and, uh, of course, cats and dogs, but also uh, lizards, a badger. And at one point, there was a small bear part of this menagerie. So that was kind of fun. Um, and then Calvin Coolidge, who we always think of, or at least I think most people think of as being very stoic and, and straight-laced, straight uh, liked to pull pranks with his staff by pushing all the intercom buttons on his phone and then hiding in his office so they couldn't find him when they came in to, to get him. Um, we also look at some of the favorite foods of presidents. Um, Barack Obama was a pizza fan. Um, Dwight Eisenhower used to, I'm not sure what he grilled, but he liked to set up a grill on the roof of the White House and, and grill. And then Richard Nixon was um, maybe infamously known for combining cottage cheese and ketchup, which I think is one of the weirder <laughs> foods that you could imagine someone eating in the White House. But uh, so, you know, we, we, there, there's, there's the mixture of what, what happens in the government, the, 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 the serious side of it with these uh, weird and unusual tidbits. And also just some trivia about the White House itself and what's in there in terms of things like uh, a putting green. And tell us about other things that are in the White House for the president to enjoy. There, there is the putting green. There is a bowling alley. Um, there's a movie theater, a running track. Uh, the, the house itself has, I believe, 132 rooms. Um, of course, part of it is, is not open to the public. It's where the president and, and their family lives. Um, and then at Camp David, there's also some very nice facilities. There's another bowling alley and there's a basketball court and a pool. So wherever they are, the president has access to some recreation and, and, and things that they can do to just kind of uh, relax a little bit. And at one point, there used to be a pool in the White House as well, but that no longer exists. Right. I think that was taken out to put in the bowling alley, if I remember the story correctly. Um, and I think Richard Nixon was the one who put in the bowling alley. I know I've seen pictures of him bowling in the White House. I think he was definitely a proponent of that. One of the things you point out is in recent history, we had an election where the, the person who won the electoral college vote did not win the popular vote. And it's pointed out that has happened several times. I, I forget exactly how many, maybe four or six times in history in the past. Yeah, I know. Um, of course, the most recent was was twenty. 16. Um, and then when George W. Bush won, that was the ca case, I believe. I'm, I'm, I am, I'm a little hazy too on the details, but I know, I think the first one was going back to maybe 1824 um, when, when John Quincy Adams won, but uh, it has happened. And it's one of the reasons why people have called for um, getting rid of the electoral college, making it strictly a popular vote. That's one of the issues we, we have set up with several issues in the book is great debates and try to present both sides of, you know, should we have electoral college? Should there be elected judges? Um, I forget some of the other issues, but, you know, taking some of these major issues, oh, should the District of Columbia become a state? These major issues that have strong feelings on both sides and, and present both sides so the kids can, can kind of 
maybe decide for themselves which which would be the best way to go. Before we talk some more about some of these both informative and just fun trivia in this book, give us an overview. What are readers going to find here? Well, we we start with some ancient history going back to Greece and Rome and how, how those are the antecedents for many of the things that are in our government. Then we jump up to um, the creation of the Constitution and how what's in it, how it's amended, what the amendments have been that have been approved over the years. And then look at the three branches, what each branch does, um, looking at some of the famous figures from each branch. And then we go down to the state level and then even county and town and tribal governments. Uh, I was keen on having that included. I live in New Mexico where we have 23 federally recognized tribes and there's almost 600 around the country. And I just felt it was important for kids to know that, you know, they, these are nations within a nation. And so uh, we, we really cover every facet of, of government. I'm talking with Michael Bergen about weird but true know-it-all, the U.S. government. And our conversation continues in a moment. If you're enjoying this conversation, please take a moment to subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you'll know when I post more interviews with authors. And thank you. Tell us more about the research that went into this book. And when you were doing that research, were there things that really surprised you? The weird things that, that pop up that aren't in normal textbooks. And so one was about the, the things that people have mailed in the past. So uh, a tree trunk, a coconut, 80,000 bricks that were then used to build the bank. Um, this fact didn't make it into the book, but when the, the government started the parcel post service, some people would actually mail their children to uh, visit their grandchildren. And uh, that only lasted about a year or two before the government said, no, you can't be mailing people. So, uh, so you know, those, those kinds of things are, again, you don't see them in, in, in normal history books and, and they just show the, the, how go weird government can be. I mean, at, it's the state level. I was struck by some of the things that people, um, that governments have made their official, whatever, you know, it's North Carolina has an official, uh, carnivorous plant, the Venus flytrap. Texas has official footwear, the cowboy boot. Uh, my state of New Mexico has an official question, which is red or green, which relates to what color chili do you want on your, your food? And if you want both, you say Christmas. So, you know, it's, it's the state, the state facts, you know, if you live in that state, you might know it, but if you don't, it's, it's probably going to be uh, interesting to you to see what people have chosen to uh, memorialize in their states. And you did point out it, for example, in my home state, that there's a official state fossil as well. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is kind of the weird things you discovered about government agencies that, you know, are part of the whole governance system. But one of the ones that uh, the book talks about is how they wanted to basically use cats as spies, <laughs> but it didn't really work out. Yeah. And it's, I think I just saw something in the news recently that kind of brought this story back up. And I'm not sure why, but they wanted to insert um, devices in the cats, then send them out to to gather information. And of course, cats are kind of hard to train, so they they realized this was not really going to work. But uh, I believe that the pigeons they had more success using pigeons. I mean, obviously, going back to earlier times, carrying messages. But I think even the CIA strapped um, cameras on them and, and used them to observe things. So it, I think the more interesting stuff, the you know, electronic intelligence gathering has led to some some different uh, interesting uh, devices over time. Governance is so complicated, especially when you get down to the uh, states where they all have different laws and, of course, cities, et cetera, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about why it's important that we make sure kids understand this or at least get some grasp about the importance of governments and understanding governance. Well, my feeling was going into this book that you know, kids, maybe they hear about Washington, D.C., and they know there's a president, but those things are so far removed from their daily life. And I was trying to get across that government is is more personal in a way. I mean, when a kid goes into a classroom, that teacher is a government employee, unless it's a private school, that, that teacher is a, a government employee. When the mail carrier brings their mail, that's the government providing a service for them. And there's so many people, I my dedication mentions this, I, I, I kind of thank all the people at the staffers at, at every level of government who really 
keep things running, even as, as leaders change from one party to another. I, I think it's important for them to see that this government affects their lives every day and, and, and their parents' lives, whether they're paying taxes or, or you know, driving on roads that are maintained with those tax dollars. There's just such a huge amount of impact on our lives from the government. And I was hoping that maybe to counteract some of the feeling that government is you know the bad guy. I think in recent decades, we've had some politicians who try to paint government as bad. And obviously political leaders make mistakes, but the, the underlying government that keeps things functioning, I think it's important to know what, what, what it's go, what's happening with that at that level. One of the uh, sections of the book that I found particularly fascinating was about the monuments there in Washington, D.C. And I didn't realize that um, when the Washington Monument was opened in, I believe it was 1888, that at that time, it was the tallest structure in the world. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember when it was surpassed, but uh, it was, and I know there was a, I don't know if we go into the book, but there was a, a long history trying to get it built. There was a lot of get, trying to get the money to keep it going. I think that's why the, there's the color of the bricks uh, is, is different because they use different stones from different times. Um, and then I was just in Washington last month and I was at the Lincoln Memorial and I was looking at the book again and saw that well, during the Civil War, there was, I, whether it was an actual artillery, whether it was practicing with artillery or actually in, in battle, but there's, there are still holes in the building from when some, some bullets or, or artillery shells struck the building. Um, but I, you know, I, hopefully every child gets a chance to go to Washington, D.C. And, and, and see the monuments there. I think it's just a, a great experience. And you note in the book that that monument was inspired in part by the Parthenon, you know, with the, the pillars and, and all of that. So fascinating information in this book. Were there some things that you originally were looking at for this book and you thought, no, that can't be right, but you discovered that, yeah, in fact, it is true? Uh, I, well, I go back to the mail one. That was the one I think, you know, I, I, I don't think I realized that you could mail so many different things. Um, the, the part about, uh, we have a little segment about the FBI having a file on Bigfoot. I thought that was kind of uh, like, really? But you can go online and you can find the file. It's, it's about um, analyzing some fur that someone found out in the woods and thought maybe it was Bigfoot. So they shipped it to the FBI and they did an analysis and they said, no, it's just from a common forest mammal. But the file is, is still there. So that was, um, that was kind of interesting. Well, speaking of looking things up, the Library of Congress, um, not everyone takes advantage of that, but the resources are immense within the Library of Congress. Tell us a bit about it. Well, it's the world's largest library. Um, they're, they're, I think the number we have in the book is like 173 million items of books and photos and film and recordings. Uh, it has the world's largest comic book collection. Um, there is a copy of the map from 1507 that first used the word America to label uh, the continents over here, North and South America. Um, there is a copy of, or the original drawing that Maya Lin did when she was designing the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, they're, they're, the books, they have the, the smallest book in the collection is the size of a period on a page. And it's called Old King Cole. I don't know how you read it, but obviously you're not picking it up. And the largest book, you're also not picking up probably, it's five feet by seven feet, and it's a picture book of the country of Bhutan. So I thought that was, you know, just a very interesting, eclectic mix of things. Michael, before I let you go, I'm curious, you've written a number of books for middle grade readers. What is it you enjoy about writing for this age group? Um, I think it's two things. One of them is I like the challenge of taking complex ideas and, and making them relatable. And, and certainly with a book like this, making it fun as much as possible. Um, and then there's personal satisfaction. I was a history major, but I learn things all the time when I write a book like this or any of the books I've written. It's You just get to delve into the research and maybe everything you, you learn doesn't make it into the final product, but I feel like I'm, I'm learning a lot and that just that's very satisfying. And I should note that because this is a National Geographic book, it's filled with wonderful illustrations and photographs. And even though it is geared toward a middle grade audience, I think it appeals to the kid and all of us because I certainly found things that I enjoyed reading about. 
That's great. Well, I think, I mean, this is the third book I've done for this series. And I think all of them have that element of, you know, you, you draw the kids in with the great graphics and the, and the weird facts, but there's a lot of solid knowledge and, and it's something that, that adults and kids can share together. The book from National Geographic Kids is Weird But True Know-It-All, U.S. Government by Michael Bergen. Michael, thank you for talking with me today. Thank you very much for having me, Dan. I appreciate it. If you'd like to purchase Weird But True Know-It-All, U.S. Government, I've placed a link for you in the description below. A thank you for watching this edition of the Kids Bookshelf. And if you'd like to see more videos about children's books and their authors, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. And if you're interested in books for young adult and older readers, be sure to check out my Some Books Considered channel, and you'll find a link to it below as well. I'm Dan Skinner. Until next time, keep sharing the gift of reading.